Today we are taking a look at Schneider Kreuznar's new ISCO for All set, a bundle of three full frame spherical primes and an updated version of their incredibly sought after 1.5 times anamorphic adapter, the Iskarama 54. I have been really excited to test this one out, so let's get into it. The original Iskarama 54 was released all the way back in the late 70s, and over the past few years, they have become very sought after and expensive, with them selling for upwards of £3,000, and good condition ones becoming rarer and rarer to find. This is because the 54 has a solid reputation for its good image quality and single focusing system. There are other versions of the Iskarama available, and the numbers in their names are referring to the diameter of the glass at the rear of the lens, which on the 54 is 54 millimeters. The ISCO for all set is priced at £6,000, excluding VAT, so roughly 7,200 including VAT. This may sound like a lot, but when you consider you are getting three full frame spherical cine primes, as well as the ISCO 54 attachment, all in a nice pelly case, and the market it sits in, I actually think it's very reasonably priced. When we take a look at the pricing of new anamorphic solutions, of which there are only really a few options on the market, and even fewer that cover full frame sensors, the ISCO for all sets price actually looks quite reasonable, especially considering you are getting three different focal lengths in this kit. Of course, you can get any of the other available anamorphic adapters and attach them onto a taken lens, but the ISCO for all is aimed at being more readily available and will come with fewer headaches than the traditional DIY anamorphic route, which again will help justify its price. Since starting the video, things have become a little clearer. The set we are looking at here is the rental version, but there is also the retail version, and there are two key differences. The first difference is the coatings. The set we have with us here is Lens's Tweet V+, whereas the retail kit features the A plus coating, which is more tuned towards an amber looking flare. The set we have here also comes with a PL mount as standard, but the retail version comes with an EF mount as standard. Otherwise, the two sets should be identical. The Iskarama 54 has a squeeze factor of 1.5 times. And this means that if you use the Isco 54 with a 16x9 format and then de-squeeze it in post, it will work out to roughly a 24x9 aspect ratio, which is roughly 2.67 to 1. So you will need to crop in on the image slightly if you want to get down to a more conventional anamorphic aspect ratio. However, I can see this kit being used on cameras that have different aspect ratios for acquisitions such as 3x2 and 4x3. 3x2 will result in a 2.25 to 1 ratio and 4x3 will result in 2 to 1. 2 to 1 has become a common aspect ratio as it strikes a nice balance between 239 and 16x9. It's very common on Netflix. This makes it quite a versatile squeeze to deal with no matter what format you want to use and there are plenty of options across cameras and monitors now to de-squeeze 1.5. I wanted to double check what the actual de-squeeze factor was, as the original Escarama 54, even though denoted as 1.5 times, was actually 1.42 times. This is still the case with the new Isco 54. Monitoring at 1.5 will be fine, but just make sure to de-squeeze your images in post with 1.42 times if you want normal looking images. We managed to grab some quick test shots down in Teddington, as well as shoot some more controlled examples in our studio using a couple of Schneider adapters. Let's check out how the footage looks. The look of the 1.5 times anamorphic isn't quite as strong as that of one with a higher squeeze ratio, but I think the ISCO does still have a really nice anamorphic feel to it. The new ISCO 54 shares a good amount with the old 54. It has the same single focus mechanism that uses a variable strength diopter. Unfortunately, this means it has the same rotating front as the previous 54. And this means that you can't use clamp on matte boxes. You will need to use some kind of donut or screw on filters that won't be affected by this rotation as you focus. 
It really is a bit of a shame that Schneider didn't rework this, especially with the addition of the standard 0.8 pitch gear ring onto the focus ring, which is a welcomed addition. However, because the barrel moves when you focus, you will need a wide gear positioned correctly, otherwise with thinner gears, the gear will slip off, which nobody wants. The lens also features a new dual scale for both Imperial and Metric, and the marks are painted and not engraved, which you will see on more expensive lenses. The original 54 has a close focus of 2 meters, whereas the new 54 now has a close focus of 1.4 meters. Schneider must be using a slightly different diopter now, which allows the lens to focus closer, which is something anamorphic shooters will appreciate, as 2 meters is a pretty hefty close focus, and you will see plenty of people with 54s, as well as other anamorphic lenses and solutions, using diopters to improve the minimum focus distance. And of course, you will also want to do this here, even with 1.4 meters. There are some 95mm screw on filters available, but they're quite hard to find, so a matte box solution may be what you want to look for instead. One big benefit of the ISCO 54 is how focusing the lens works. As with the original, you set your taken lens to infinity and then control focus via the adapter only. There are DIY options that work this way, but lots of anamorphic adapters don't and will require both focusing on the taken lens and the adapter, which can be a real pain. The 54 features a massive 270 degree focus rotation that feels very smooth throughout its range, though for people wanting to hand operate it, it does require a good amount of force to move it. This will definitely benefit from being rigged up with either a manual or electric phonofocus that can drive it. One of the downsides of using an anamorphic adapter with a taken lens is making sure that the anamorphic element is correctly aligned so your image isn't skewed and your flares are horizontal. You can adjust the orientation of the 54 using the adjustable rotation knob here. Just undo it, adjust by turning this ring and lock it off. The best way to make sure your adapter is correctly orientated is to try and use a straight edge in your frame. Using grids can also be a great way to do this if the camera you are using has them so you can line up any lines with them. One really helpful thing that this new version of the 54 features over the older versions is the addition of a quarter 20 thread for lens supports on the bottom of it. And this means that you'll be able to level it off much faster when using a lens support foot, as in theory, when using one, the lens should be level when you mount it onto this point. I would argue that using a lens support when using the ISCO 54 is an absolute must. Not only is it quite a large setup, but it's also not very stable when you're not using one. When using the lens by hand, I found that you could hit infinity while focusing, and you could sometimes unthread it from your taken lens, but this won't happen when using a lens support. One thing worth knowing about when grabbing a lens support for this setup is whether or not the support allows for the adjustment of the support posts left and right position. We first tried the ISCO setup with a Vocas 15mm support, which does allow you to move the support posts left and right. This allows you to shift the orientation of the anamorphic adapter, which we found to be helpful but also easy to accidentally result in skewed imagery. Personally, we found using a support that doesn't allow for the shifting of the support post to work much easier, such as this Crozier one we used here. With the original ISCO 54, some third party solutions did pop up to make things a bit sturdier, such as this red stand clamp, and there are different lens support styles out there, but a regular quarter 20 post one will work fine here. We've put some recommendations for lens supports down in the description below. Physically, the new 54 is roughly the same size as the original which means it's pretty large, but this isn't surprising given that it's an anamorphic lens. It has two filter threads, 95mm on the front and 77mm on the back for mounting to your Titan lens. Though like the original 54, the rear element is large and protrudes out quite far. The Taken lens primes that come in the set have a front filter thread of 72mm, and the set comes with two different 77 to 72mm adapters so you can mount them easily. The thicker of the two is for the 58 and 85mm, whereas the smaller one is for the 43mm. The closer you can get the front element of your taken lens to the rear element of the 54, the fewer coverage issues you will run into. Having to swap between different taken lenses is both a positive and a negative. When we compare a normal lens swap when shooting with fully enclosed anamorphics to swapping taken lenses, it of course takes more time, is more fiddly, has a greater risk of stuff getting onto your lens elements, and there is more to get wrong in the process. This is one of the compromises you make when using this kind of setup, and it's reflected in the cost for the quality of anamorphic you are getting. However, you could also look at this as making the lenses more versatile, 
because not only can you use the Dew Lens Primes as regular spherical primes, but you can also use the ISCO with other Taken lenses if you wanted to as well. The kit comes with three Taken lenses that Schneider have collaborated with Dew Lens on. For those that don't know who Doolens are, they are a new lens company based in Hong Kong that has been causing a little bit of a stir with their relatively low cost but very good looking APO mini primes. In this kit you get three primes, a 43, 58 and 85mm, all of which have a maximum aperture of T2.4. Each lens is the same size with a length of 83mm and a width of 81.6mm and they all have consistent gear placements across the set. They are actually incredibly compact, especially when you consider the image circle which is 46.5mm across the three lenses and the PL or EF mount that they can come as. Each lens features an 11 blade iris and a fully spherical APO design. These lenses have slightly different coatings to the ones that Dew Lens normally sell. The mechanics of the Dew Lenses are actually incredibly solid. Both the focus and iris rotations are on the heavier side but are still super smooth. The housing is also gorgeous, it's all metal and just feels really solid in the hand. The focus throw is roughly 270 degrees and both the focus and iris have standard 0.8 pitch gears. However, one design compromise that these lenses have is how close the iris gear is to the rear of the lens. And this means that with certain mounts, using focus motors will be very difficult as they are so close to these mounts. For example, the Venice or Mini LF we have here. But considering how small the lenses are, it would have required either the aperture markings or the gear to be here, and Dew Lens chose to prioritise the markings. The lenses' close focuses aren't great, but they are going to be primarily used with the ISCO, which have a worse close focus, so it's not the end of the world, and again, a compromise because of the size of these lenses. When it comes to weights, Schneider didn't provide the exact weights of the kit, so we weighed everything. The Dew Lenses by themselves all weigh around 500 grams. This Grama 54 weighs a little bit more than the previous version, coming in at 1,078 grams. We also weighed the little thread adapters, so here are the full weights when using the correct adapter with each lens. The back focus on the three primes we have with us is out across the set. This means the adapter performs best with the lenses not at infinity, but sometimes before and sometimes after the mark. It's also a shame that the lenses go past the infinity mark as it means that if the lenses are shimmed correctly for infinity, then if you go past it, your anamorphic won't be as sharp as it could be. Personally, I think that these lenses being tweaked for the set, they should have had a hard stop at infinity and then be correctly shimmed out of the box. This way, when using them in a taken lens setup, you can move your focus to the hard stop and know that you're sharp. The do lenses can be adjusted pretty easily to correct your infinity, and with the normal do lens set, you can switch between PL and EF mount really easily as well. Schneider have also announced a bunch of new accessories that will be available separately from the kit. Schneider actually makes a bracket that will lock your focus gear in place at infinity, which will mean you can know 100% for sure that you are at infinity and do not need to worry about it moving when shooting. As we said, the lenses come EF as standard, but you will be able to grab PL mounts for each lens if you require it separately. Schneider will also be making a larger support bracket, which will allow you to support the ISCO 54 with quarter or 3 8 inch supports. Lastly, they'll be making a range of adapters for different thread sizes. This will be available in an 8-piece set consisting of the following, or individually. When it comes to the coverage performance of the lenses, we captured the spherical primes and then all three lenses with the ISCO 54 attached. The spherical primes have a rated image circle of 46.5mm, and when using them on cameras like the Alexa Mini LF or Red V Raptor, you will have no troubles with vignetting. Across all three focal lengths, illumination is great, with no hard vignette. When we attach the anamorphic adapter, coverage changes massively. Starting with the 43mm, we can see heavy vignetting towards the corners of frame when being used with the Mini LF in its 3x2 open gate mode. This means the 43mm, when paired with the ISCO, will require extra zooming when being used in most full frame 3x2 modes. The 58mm has a little bit of vignetting towards the corners of frame, and the 85mm has the most constant illumination across the frame. Coverage is far better at infinity than close focus across all three setups. If you want to see exactly how they perform on your camera in your favourite format, head over to our lens coverage and camera comparison tool over on our website. Link to that is in the description below. Across each different focal length, when using the adapter, we can see a few consistent characteristics such as a blue-green fringe past the point of focus and more purple before the point of focus throughout the focal and t-stop range of the lenses. We can see interesting shape that isn't perfectly elliptical as you may want it to be. 
Otherwise, the highlights are also pretty clean of texture, which will be mainly due to the fully spherical design of the dew lens. You can also see quite defined edges, though this does change slightly through the different focal lengths. Starting with the 43mm, shape in the centre is good, but does get much more swirly towards the corners. This shape is pretty consistent as you stop down though. Towards the corners of frame, we can see heavy distortion to our out of focus highlights, but this probably falls out of the usable section of the frame. You can also see much more wacky aberrations in our out of focus highlights as they hit the edges of the frame. The 58mm is much better wide open. In the centre it is decently oval, but towards the corners of frame we can see misshapen highlights. A T4 performance gets better in the corners, but it's still not consistent to the centre of frame. The 85mm wide open has an interesting shape. It's almost shaped like a bean in the middle and has some cutting towards the corners of frame. This cutting towards the corners of frame is still present down to T4, but at T5.6 it's quite reduced. Shape in the middle is also better as you stop down as well. I think shape looks best from around T4 onwards here. If we look at the lenses without the anamorphic element attached, we can see that the 43mm has clean bokeh in the center of frame, but swirling shape consistently across the frame and cat's eye shapes bokeh towards the corners of frame. The bokeh itself has quite a defined edge, with only a small touch of aberration and a bit of texture which is present throughout the T-stop range. Stopping down to T2.8 makes the shape more circular in the middle of the frame, but we still have more cat's eye shape towards the corners of the frame. We can also see the 11 blade iris forming shape but it's still decently circular. At T4, the bokeh towards the corners of the frame is more consistently shaped also. Looking at the 58mm and 85mm, performance is incredibly similar to that of the 43mm. You still have swirly bokeh wide open, which becomes more uniform as you stop down. I really like the look of these lenses wide open. The swirly character wide open screams vintage. There are both single and multi-coated versions of the old ISCO 54 units with the single coating version being a bit harder to come by than the multi and flaring much more. This new 54 uses a multi-coated design, though I have been told the unit we have with us here isn't the final coating design. The way the flare looks is obviously one of the most important things when it comes to the overall look of an anamorphic setup. So let's take a look at the flare in a controlled setup. Starting with the 43mm, we can see heavy rainbow flaring around the torch source and a very subtle blue streak going across the frame. We can also see a good amount of veiling glare across the frame, with some interesting blue corner flaring which looks like some kind of hard barrel flare. This corner flare is consistent but does get less strong as you stop down. Otherwise flare is pretty consistent throughout the T-stop range. It's a very similar story with the 58mm. We can see heavy rainbow flare off of our source as well as some flares in the corners that look like the barrel of the lens. There's a very subtle blue horizontal flare throughout the T-stop range but this is incredibly faint. At T2.8, veiling glare is much more controlled and overall flaring is reduced. As we stop down, flaring is reduced and the corner does get less strong as you stop down. The 85mm again performs very similarly to the other lenses with similar veiling glare and a subtle blue streak, though it doesn't have quite the same rainbow flaring around the point source. It's a bit more of a subtle flare. As you stop down, this does get more controlled with less veiling glare. For these tests, we also shot the flare examples with a blue streak filter from Vaxis to see if we could get the setup to flare a little bit more strongly. I think the filter we use results in a flare that is a bit too thick on the 58 and 85 mm but proves a setup like this could work if you want to flare the lens a little bit easier. The Do Lens Primes themselves flare very nicely without the ISCO attached. We've put our full uncut lens tests into a longer video on our Vimeo, link to which is down in the description below. If we take a look at the examples we shot with the Do Lens without the anamorphic adapter attached, we can really see how much of the flare of the setup with the adapter comes from the Do Lens. The rainbow flare is present on the Do Lens and I think they flare really nicely for spherical primes. Overall, I think the flare of this setup has a much more subtle look than other anamorphic solutions on the market, but that's not surprising given the previous ISCO 54 MC and how that performed. It's well controlled compared to other anamorphic lenses, but that may be what you want, or it might not be. Anamorphic lenses aren't known for being the sharpest lenses, but the ISCO 54 is known for being a well-resolving lens, and this is still the case here. Starting with the 43mm, we can see that stopping down to T5.6 massively improves center resolving performance. There is also clear aberration across the frame even when you stop down. This is a similar story for the 58mm, but I would say it resolves slightly better with slightly less CA. The 85mm has the most aberration wide open, but it performs very well when stopped down. 
Overall, as with the older ISCO 54, these combinations do perform well for an anamorphic lens and seem to strike a nice balance of character and resolving power. When it comes to how well the do lens performs separately, they are excellent. They are very clean of aberration due to the APO design of them. They perform excellently wide open with some fall off towards the corners of frame, but this is improved as you stop down. For distortion, we grab tests of each lens with the anamorphic lens attached and not. Looking at just the spherical lenses, the 43mm looks great, the 58mm has a touch of barrel and the 85mm has a touch of pincushion. But this is an incredibly small amount, they perform excellently. Looking at them with the anamorphic adapter attached, we can see heavy barrel distortion with the 43mm and as you go up the focal range this barreling is reduced but is still present. These lenses do compress the image quite heavily towards the corners of frame. As we pan from the middle towards the corners of the frame, we can see just how much this anamorphic element is compressing and distorting him. This is quite common on anamorphic lenses. When it comes to breathing, these lenses do exhibit disproportionate lens breathing that is present in anamorphic lenses. And this is because of the two different focal lengths, which are obviously the horizontal and vertical, being different on anamorphic lenses. This results in a different feel to the breathing and most consider it to have a much more cinematic quality than spherical breathing. The amount of breathing is consistent throughout the three lenses with the anamorphic attached. And I would say lens breathing is a much more desired characteristic when shooting anamorphic and this setup will give you the unique look and feel that you may want from anamorphic lens breathing. When using the lenses just spherically, we can also see quite a bit of breathing on each lens. This was most likely a compromise that was made when designing the optics. Coming in at roughly 7,200 pounds, including VAT, the ISCO for All works out at roughly 2,400 pounds per lens. It's one of the most affordable, new and readily available PL or EF mount anamorphic solutions on the market. I think the biggest drawback of this bundle is the fact that it is an adapter based solution, of course. Yes, there are ways to make sure your anamorphic element is level, but I think it is going to be easy to make mistakes and have unwanted skew on your footage. Whereas if the lenses were housed in a single housing or slightly redesigned a little bit, these issues could have been reduced massively. But obviously you can get fantastic results. And the benefit is you essentially get a set of three spherical primes and three anamorphic primes that you can use depending on what you need. The Do Lens Collaboration Primes are fantastic lenses in their own right. So using them without the anamorphic adapter is a great option if you don't need to shoot anamorphic. They really are gorgeous, lightweight, well-housed lenses. Honestly, it's just fantastic that Schneider are putting out some more optics as they haven't for a while. Fingers crossed this is the start of them bringing more products to the market, especially more anamorphic options. Anyway, let us know what you think of the ISCO for All set in the comments below. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe even consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.